Sound check, test one, two, three, sound check. Hello everyone, we're going to start at 2 o'clock, so make sure you get your refreshments and come take a seat. Five minutes.
Super duper. Well, just that announcement got everyone all quieted down, so um, we're just about to start our town hall. I'm Annette Lankoff from Midtown, and I'm going to be your moderator. So I'd like to welcome everyone to this town hall, which is a gathering of the Midtown and the Palo Verde neighborhoods to discuss key issues with our elected city council members and staff. Now, holding town halls like this is a key council priority, and we are the fourth town hall. Council members, and you wonder, you know, how do we pick these two? They take turns in co-hosting these sessions. There are other council members, which I will introduce everyone shortly, in the audience, but they're here just to listen, uh, not to answer questions during the town hall. But if you'd like to talk to them, we're going to have a little time at the end so you can have another cookie and ask them your favorite question or make a comment. So with, with the entire world and trauma and turmoil, it's really good to come together as a community in Palo Alto. Thank you for coming. And thanks to our city officials and our elected council members for this opportunity. So at this point in time, I'd like to welcome our honored guests, starting with council members on the program. Now, I think it would be great, and someone just said it, let's keep this a tight ship, so it would be great if we could hold the applause to the end, but you can wave your hands or in recognition, et cetera, if you're so moved. So starting with our um, first council member, it is Vice Mayor Greer Stone, and Greer will be giving the opening remarks. Next is council member Vicki Venker on the end, and Vicki will be giving some closing remarks. So other council members in the audience, we have Mayor Lydia Koo. Lydia, where are you? She's in the back of the room. Um, and also council member and past mayor P Pat Burt. Don't, don't think I saw any other council member, but if so, wave your hand and we'll get you recognized. And we want to thank all of the council members for the service to our community. Now the city staff that will be speaking, and let me just do this in the order that we are going to make comments. First of all is our city manager, Ed Shikata, and he's brought with him to discuss the topic of economic development, his staff member on economic development, Steve Galigardo. Um, our police chief, Andrew Binder, um, our planning and development director, Jonathan Late, and our Directory of Community Service, Kristen O'Kane. I'd also li like to recognize uh, two other of our public safety chiefs in the audience. Uh, first of all, Chief Blackshire, our fire chief. Uh, Gio, I don't know, but there, there he is somewhere in the back on the side over there. And uh, for Office of Emergency Services, Chief Duker, who is in the back of the room. So, a couple more thank yous. Um, special thanks to Communication Director Megan Horrigan-Taylor and her staff for the logistics and setting up the meeting, the refreshments, the key part, and for joining us on a weekend. So now, let's give them all a big round of applause. But before I turn the podium over for our welcome, I also want to recognize our two community leaders in the two focused neighborhoods, both Cherry Furman, who is the chair of Midtown Residents, who will close the meeting, and Tom Fowler at the back table in his snappy orange vest, oh, he doesn't have his orange vest anymore, who um, was describing our emergency service volunteer program and would be happy to share more information about this program and how we are organized to build resilient neighborhoods. A final thanks to Palo Alto Neighborhoods, a community networking organization for their overall help. You can go to the PAN website, paneighborhoods.org, and it's a great resource if you want to volunteer, lots of opportunities and general information for residents. And now, Help me in welcoming our Vice Mayor Greer Stone, Palo Alto native and resident of Midtown for some opening remarks. Thank you. 
Hi, good afternoon, and thank you for being here today. As Annette said, my name is Greer Stone. I'm the Vice Mayor of Palo Alto, and I'm particularly excited about being here today because, as Annette said, I am a resident of Midtown as well, live uh, near Phil's Coffee, and I'm the former chair of the MRA as well, so this is a, a neighborhood that's always been very close to my heart, so really happy to be here and to be surrounded by fellow neighbors and community members. Uh, we're, we're here today because the City Council made it a top priority to enhance community engagement by implementing a series of neighborhood town hall meetings and to hear directly from you, the residents. Council adopted a plan for this effort in the fall of 2022, and we're about halfway through holding one neighborhood meeting each quarter over the, over the past two years. Planning these events is really no easy task, and it really requires collaboration between council, city staff, neighbor, and neighborhood leaders around the city. With everything from the date and location to the format and discussion topics developed together. Um, and I really do just kind of also want to just take a moment, there are also several other staff members that are here today who are giving up their Sunday afternoon to be able to make this possible. So if we could give a, give a round of applause to acknowledge their efforts as well, please. Now the agenda items listed on today's agenda are your top priorities in working with neighborhood leaders to plan today's meeting. Our role as council co-hosts is really, it's an important one. Council members are, are taking turns as co-hosts uh, at town halls conducted throughout the city. And my council colleague, Vicki Vinker, and I are mostly here to be able to listen to you, to your concerns and your ideas, and then we will take, them, take that valuable input back to, uh, back to council and to be able to share that as we continue to implement priorities really based on uh, on what we hear today but we're also here to be able to also respond to questions along with with staff we've worked with neighborhood leaders and city staff on planning for today's discussion and mixing the importance of really sharing updates on your top priorities and balancing those updates as well with unstructured time to be able to listen and to respond to your questions. And staff are also here to be able to help answer your questions and follow up with you after the meeting uh, as well, if, if needed. So thank you very much. We're looking forward to an engaging discussion. And also just want to acknowledge former council member, um, Allison Cormick, who walked in as well. So if we can give her a round of applause too. Great. Well, thank you, everybody, for being here. It's a beautiful Sunday, but we're excited to have this, this community dialogue with you. Thank you, Vice Mayor. Now, I'd like to explain how the rest of the town hall will work. The next hour are going to address the key topics, as was just mentioned. Um, that rose to the top when residents took the survey. And if this is the first time you've heard about the survey, we publish this through our Google group groups, so make sure you are tuned in to the Residents Association. So the key officials, as uh, Vice Mayor said, who are here today will d address their key areas of expertise. Economic development came way far above the, the top um, issue in our survey. Crime traffic, housing, and an update on Carberly. Each speaker will speak for five minutes, and we're timing them, um, thanks to the comment about running a tight ship, and then open the floor to questions and answers for about 10 minutes on that topic. So let's stay with the question and answers, focus on that topic. Hopefully, you'll keep your questions and, and our responses to about one minute, so we'll have time for everyone else that wants to make a question or a comment. We have two wonderful timekeepers, both uh, Midtown Steering Committee member, Sam Gersten, um, and Ann Cribs, who everyone in Palo Alto knows, that will do the um, timing, uh, actually hold up time cards for the moderator and the speaker to show how long that they're talking and the, to wrap up their comments. 
about 3.15, which is about a little over an hour, we'll open the floor to anything you want to ask, comments, questions and answers. And at 3.50, we'll turn the mic over to Council Member Venker for her closing comments. And Sherry Furman will also end the meeting. We'll have social time with more cookies and soda, et cetera, at the back of the room for about 15 minutes. So at this point, I would like to turn the program over to our city manager, Ed Shikata, to address the first topic, economic development in South Palo Alto. Thank you very much, Annette. Yes, and you're gonna, someone's gonna keep time for me, right? So that if I run long, which I can do, that uh, you'll bring out the hook. I'll also uh, try to moderate the volume because it is a bit booming or it can be booming. So I'm gonna try right around here. If at any point you cannot hear me, please just raise your hand and uh, I'll get a little more booming. So first off, let me just uh, introduce myself. Ed Shikata again. Closer, really. Wow, and you're close to the speaker too. So, all right, well, we'll, we'll give it a shot and uh, see how this goes. Ed Shikata, I have been your city manager for coming up on five years, and it really is my honor to uh, be city manager here in Palo Alto. I've been asked to speak on the topic of economic development, and let me first off point out something that may be a secret or may not be a popular thing to say or may be obvious, uh, depending on your perspective. but Economic development in Palo Alto has come a long way since COVID. I will tell you that before COVID, the economy was good. There were businesses uh, thriving uh, in large measure. Uh, we had the highest per capita sales tax in the county by far. Uh, and, you know, in some ways we thought things were always going to be good. COVID totally turned that upside down. Clearly, in terms of businesses struggling, sales tax revenues falling, and employment uh, really has changed uh, our view and expectations of what economic development is. You know, Pre-COVID, we would hear that concerns about traffic, about, uh, excuse me, I have to take my glasses off here, about traffic, about uh, tech industry growth, taking up and creating more office uh, demand, uh, and other quality of life issues were really the primary concerns that we would hear about at the city. And so since COVID, clearly, we've recognized that we depend on business. We all need businesses, whether it be those uh, driving industries as they're referred to in technology, to support then neighborhood serving businesses that we all rely on. So as a result, in recognizing that shift, the city undertook what was over a year effort to create a comprehensive economic development strategy. So in August, the city council approved the first step in that strategy in terms of the base elements and identified a number of follow-up efforts. Uh, at the same time, we recognized that the issues with the economy were at large are con continuing, including that many of the businesses that remain in town are not seeing business at the same level that they did previously. Now, it's definitely a mixed bag. Some are doing well and some are not doing well, but we do hear on an ongoing basis concerns about ability to attract employees. Uh, certainly, all businesses are having difficulty finding employees, and that's raised uh, and certainly raised the visibility of the importance of affordable housing nearby and that allows businesses to have the employees they need to provide the services that we all depend on. During the pandemic, we had eviction moratoria that, uh, as you may recall, apply to re both residential as well as commercial properties. But we've uh, certainly seen since and through that experience the complexities of the landlord-tenant relationships and that also depend on all parties, whether it's be government, including the city, landlords, businesses and customers that are all really critical to success of business uh, at all levels. So then back on that economic development strategy that the city uh, approved, there were three basic principles. One was to recognize the distinct stri uh, one minute left or one minute gone? Oh boy, all right, oh boy, okay. Then in that case, let me just jump to the bottom line here and talk about Midtown. Uh, 
first off, uh, let me note that we've been very engaged, as I know many of you have been on a variety of Midtown specific issues. One being building business engagement of the businesses that are currently here in t Midtown and getting organized. And we can thank Mike uh, Filippo for his role in, and um, oh, I'm blanking, Phil. Mike Mike, Mike Walu and Len Flupu, oh boy, I combined their names there. My apologies to both of them. Uh, but in any case, the concern and the, the challenge to Mike's uh, diner really brought uh, a lot of attention uh, to the needs uh, for the community to support them in staying you know, afloat, as well as the need to organize businesses in order to work together. Then, um, also want to note that following the Midtown fire with Phil's, uh, Bill's, and other businesses in the center, uh, we've, uh, as you see, largely been waiting for follow-up to occur. The uh, fire department, the first responder, and obviously is the uh, primary department involved at that point. But then immediately after, their focus has turned to ensuring that the property was safe and is safe for people to both enter and for work to happen to rehabilitate the building. We've been in contact with the building owner as well as uh, with their insurance company and know that that's proceeding, it's still proceeding at snail's pace, but quite frankly, that's insurance companies and the way that they operate. And at this point, we're awaiting a final plan for them to remediate the hazardous materials that exist within the structure, as well as then ensure that the structure can be rebuilt in a safe manner. We do know, and we've heard, the businesses are interested in going back into the building. So I know we can all, um, we're all looking forward to that date coming soon. Well, thank you, Ed. And uh, we all definitely uh, enjoying having Mike be back in business or continue to business. Lunch and breakfast are now going to be available next week, and we look forward to our four businesses returning to uh, the area of Middlefield and um, Loma Verde. Well, I, at this point in time, we'd like to turn it over for 10 minutes to questions, your questions on the topic of economic development in South Palo Alto. What we would like to do is we have two people that are going to pass the mic. Paula Rugg, wonderful block preparedness coordinator in Midtown on this side, and Sylvia Gardner, member of our steering committee in Midtown on the other side. If you can't get to the center for a question, they just motion to them and they'll come over with the speaker. So now for our first speaker. Hi, I would like to give you a few minutes to explain the economic development plan for Mid, uh, Midtown. Thank you. All right, I'll go really quick. The, the basic three principles are, as I mentioned, recognize we've got distinct areas around town, whether it be K University Avenue, California Avenue, and neighborhood serving uh, districts. Each one of those have unique needs, and we need un unique strategies to, for each one of those. Second is that the city's role in particular should be, among other things, focusing on accessibility, so ensuring that we've got walkable uh, areas that people can get there easily by bike and that we've got parking available. Some of those can trade off against each other, but we recognize that that's a critical role for us to play. And then finally, to recognize that the market's changing, that what was uh, the formula for successful retail perhaps 10 years ago or even more recently is changing because of online services as well as expectations and how we all receive our goods. You know, how many Amazon boxes are on your block this week? So those, those are elements that then lead for the city to focus on zoning as some of the key uh, focus areas for us to take as well as streamlining our regulatory processes. Thank you for the question. Okay, hi, um, Randy Smith. Um, I'm curious to find out about the um, property uh, going back into the uh, Phil's Coffee, et cetera. There is this um, weird law called the Builder's Remedy, um, which says that regardless of what the city wants, any builder can go in and put in a bunch of stuff that isn't compliant with that whatsoever. It's from the state. 
Um, and thanks to the fact that unfortunately, despite great effort, Palo Alto did not satisfy the state with their plans for low income housing. So now it could be that the owner of that property can erect something that doesn't include any of the business, it doesn't matter what the city wants. Do we have any indication from the property owner that they, in, they intend to restore the four businesses there? Yes. That was a long question and a very short answer. Thank you. <laughs> Hopefully the best kind. Uh, one of the questions, uh, one of the issues that you raised was accessibility. Uh, at the intersection of Colorado and Middlefield, within the distance of 200 feet, there are three traffic lights. It, this is ridiculous. The, that parking lot where CVS and Walgreens says, driving through that is, is literally a maze. You could not have designed a more inefficient parking lot than that. I think it needs, a, it has a big impact on business. If you cannot access, reach there properly, you are bound to go somewhere else. I, I think it's a major issue that has to be addressed at a very high priority level. Thank you for your comment. I, relatively newbie in town. I've only been working in, in, here in Palo Alto for the last eight years. I'm curious, anyone know how long it's been like that? I imagine it's been quite a while. Long, long time. That, that's... There are nine different properties. It's very difficult to manage. That, thank you. That was a, a, the key point. In fact, you should have answered the question, not me. Because of the number of properties that and different interests that are involved, it's really difficult to combine them into a cohesive uh, circulation plan. Uh, but that's it. We are, uh, I know our staff is looking at what can be done on the street side of that, and there have been some options talked about. So um, perhaps stay tuned, and we're continuing to look at that. To spur retail and other business, would the city consider lowering the sales tax and substituting for it a citywide community benefit district surcharge on property values? Well, that's a pretty involved question. Um, as it happens, I don't believe the city has any discretion on the local sales tax. A number of cities have implemented city level sales tax add-ons you know on the order of a quarter or a half a percent palo alto has not done that and to that said there's not a discretion there in terms of uh, a parcel tax that's a whole other question and and i would imagine is one that would require a pretty strong consensus that that would be something of interest thank you uh when you raise your hand, can you leave it up? Because I, I, ah, there we go. Well, why don't, why don't we let her have the mic because depending on where people are, they may not be able to hear you. Hi, can everyone hear me? Yeah. Um, on the topic of- Leave me for a second. Uh, just to emphasize that we are taping this on YouTube, so it would be helpful to get volume up. Sorry. Thank you. On the topic of services in the community, um, the lovely Samyama Yoga Studio has been closed since the pandemic. Um, do you know if there are any plans to kind of re reimagine that or, or reuse that space? I am not aware of any, and as our planning director is also shaking his head, uh, I don't think we, we have not heard of any plans. Hi, um, Dr. Colley here, new resident, and I heard you mention that uh, the, s the city did not satisfy the state's low-income housing requirements, and I was wondering if you could flesh out that idea a little bit and if there are some, because that having affordable housing would allow workers 
to come here to actually work in the businesses. Our director, Late, John Late, will speak to housing in his five minutes. So let's hold that question for him. Thank you. <clears throat> Regarding the uh, Phil's Coffee, Century, Liquors, whatever, the, <clears throat> the three businesses there, my understanding is that at least some of those business owners have been prevented by the authorities from accessing their property to salvage things and assess the damage. And in a, I think if we're trying to encourage development, the first thing we have to do is not have the city standing on people's necks when they're down. And I know they claim, oh, there's hazardous materials, but if I want, if, if I were the business owner, I would want to go in there and start trying to put things back together and it would be my choice as to whether I wanted to take the risk to be exposed to alleged uh, hazardous materials and instead we make it a crime for people to do that. And so let's not make it a crime for people to try and salvage their businesses. Appreciate the thought and uh, agree that we certainly want to support businesses getting getting back on their feet. Um, just one thing worth noting is that we've got separate entities between the biz the property owner and the business owners. And again, the issues of insurance and are obviously issues that need to be worked out among them. While the city's priority is to ensure safety for anyone that goes onto the property. But understood. And agree. Thank you for putting this on. Number one, my name is Greg Hood. Live in Midtown. Um, what, what is the city doing to build consensus among the business owners on California Avenue regarding a pedestrian thoroughfare? Ah, well, um, acknowledging it's not quite a Midtown specific issue, but uh, I assume many people visit and enjoy California Avenue. This. Uh, effort and, and the question and, and really the uh, somewhat debate around whether California Avenue should remain closed to automobile traffic or open back up is, is an ongoing conversation. And in fact, the city council in early November will have a next round of that discussion to see where the consensus exists and what our next steps will be, both in terms of a long-term plan as well as the next phase, what may be a 12-month period, to either keep it status quo or to uh, make some change to open it uh, in some manner. Um, just going on to the retail in Midtown again, there's the um, what used to be the community garden, which was raised a few years ago and has since become a weed patch, a litter patch, and nothing's happened to that. Is there any updates as to what may happen to that particular part of Midtown? Thank you. I'm actually not familiar of, with that. So perhaps I could have a conversation with you after the meeting to get a little more background information on it. Um, and I'm told my time is up. Well, anyone that didn't get their question answered, we'll have open mic in about a half an hour. And also, you can talk to the folks here uh, separately. Thank you, City Manager Ed Shikata. And now, we're going to, to have the, the ever popular second speaker on crime and traffic, Police Chief Andrew Binder. Thank you. All right, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I know this is a civic-minded group, because of, instead of enjoying that sunshine outside, you're here spending two hours today with us. So thank you very much for being here and I hope we get all of your questions answered. I always like to start these town halls by telling you what a privilege it is, not only to serve this community, the Palo Alto community in a law enforcement function, but also as your chief and let you know how much I deeply care about your safety. You know, safety for me and the officers that work for me is our number one priority. And I have this aspirational goal that not only is Palo Alto a safe city, but that you feel safe when you're out there shopping, you're at the parks, you're taking your walks, you're riding your bikes. I want you to, it's important that you hear that from me. And I know that Chief Duker and Chief Blackshire, the two other public safety chiefs share that same sen sentiment. 
And then lastly, we wanna connect with you. Your police department wants to connect with you. I hope you got a chance to see Officer Ramirez out at the front when you came in. Take a good look. She's gonna be a future chief one day. She's one of our recent hires. She is an up and comer. She's out there and, and we're here today in person because we want you to get to know us and that's really important. I'm gonna run through really two quick real priorities and then I'm gonna to get to crime and traffic. Anne's running a really tight ship too, so Anne, I will be on the lookout for your pink paper and I may go over a little bit, but we'll see. Our two priorities for your police department, number one is recruiting, hiring, and retention. In 2020, when the world crashed from COVID, the police department took an 18% cut in our budget. That was personnel and other things that walked out the door. I'm extremely grateful for our prior city council and present city council for the last two years who have worked to restore those services to get the bodies in the building, both our sworn, which are the officers that wear the, the badge and the uniform and our professional staff, our dispatchers, our records clerks, our radio technicians, our property and evidence techs into our building, back into our building so we could give y'all the level of service that you want and that you deserve. And we're getting there uh, just this year traffic's going to come up this budget council again appreciative of their effort to traffic officers that um, once I can get those my vacancies filled you'll see two more additional uh, traffic officers out onto the street and the second is community engagement now that we're past COVID, if there was ever a time when the police department needed to connect with its community it was over the last couple years and we're out there uh, the last two years we've done National Night Out. That's the first Tuesday uh, of every August. If you haven't uh, attended one of our block parties or neighbor's block party, I really encourage you to do that. We have a, also a, 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 an event we call Breaking with the Law. It's Palo Alto's version of Coffee with a Cop. We're gonna have one in the coming weeks where we go out to a local coffee shop. We've been to Midtown here uh, a couple months ago with Annette and we just hang out for two hours. You got a question? You wanna to get to know your police department, I encourage you to come out. Uh, something you can do from home, we have a website. I have a quarterly blog. There's a ton of information on the website. You wanna communicate with us. You wanna send something in about a traffic concern, a parking concern, something that's going on in your neighborhood. We get those, we respond to those. We will get back to you. Um, all right, let's talk about crime. I am very grateful that as the Palo Alto chief, I can stand before this group and tell you that Palo Alto is a very safe city. Let me repeat that. Palo Alto is a very safe city and our, our violent crime is very low. Now we do have violent crime and we do have crime, but when, when we do have those, those brazen criminal acts, they make such a, 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 an impact in this community where you'll read it in the local paper or you'll hear about it on your next door threads because um, those events are very few and far between. Um, with that said, you know, the, the uh, majority of crime that we do see in here is property crime. And so I won't ask you to raise your hand uh, if you've been if subject to some type of home break in, auto burglary, catalytic converter, um, some vandalism. When I looked at the Midtown and Palo Verde um, crime stats, those are definitely. Um, what has been happening most in your neighborhood. Now, let me share something. It doesn't mean that you guys are targeted. When I look at the stats throughout the city, we know that crime is cyclical and we know that there isn't one neighborhood that is targeted more than others. You know, also when I get up here and I say, hey, I'm really grateful that we're not a violent city and we only have property crime. I wanna make sure that you don't, um, I don't miss uh, the importance of how uh, vulnerable it can be to be uh, a victim of a crime. I remember as a young boy when my house was broken into and coming home and seeing my parents' drawers out, how scared I felt and how victimized I felt. And so it's not lost on the police department that just because I can get up here and say, hey, it's just property crime, doesn't mean that we don't worry about it. And we do take those things um, very seriously. Um, Two, uh, two things that I'm really proud of that I just wanna highlight. One is our license plate reader technology. Again, thank you to our current council for supporting us in those ende endeavors. We have 10 of our 20 cameras that are up and I can tell you that 
that system, that tool is already making an impact on our ability to suppress, um, combat, and investigate crime here um, in this community. And the second one is just a couple weeks ago, we um, were granted $5.1 million by the state of California for, to combat organized retail theft. And that's in our university, that's our Stanford Shopping Center, that's our Midtown, that's Cal Ave, that's throughout the whole entire city. And we're really excited for that because that gives me the opportunity to use that money. The state's given me a lot of discretion to use that money to get officers out in the community to be visible and to combat organized retail theft, which is really, if you're following uh, the media at all, is really a, it's a Bay Area problem. And you know these crews are very sophisticated. They're very strategic. Um, they plan what they're doing. They'll hit multiple uh, cities in a single day, and a lot of them are armed. And so they're very dangerous. Um, I never would recommend getting involved. Uh, if you see something like that going on, your best bet is to always call 911 but I'm really excited about our ability to make um, Palo Alto even safer in that respect. I got you there, Ann. All right, let's move on to traffic. Um, I, you know, at all of these, I think it was mentioned that this is our fourth town hall meeting. I will tell you that the predominant topic is always traffic. And I, we know that in our, our media over the last few weeks, there's been a lot about the accidents that have happened. Um, I know in the next door feeds, there's a lot about the accident. A couple weeks ago, the mayor and I came out with a joint message. It was, it was twofold. Number one is to bring awareness to what's happening out there. But number two is to remind everyone that safety is a responsibility of all of us. And so if you don't remember anything I say today, this afternoon, I want, I want to just repeat that. Safety is a responsibility of everyone in this room. We are all on Team Palo Alto. Doesn't matter if you're driving a bike, a car, you're riding a bike, you're walking. It, safety is a responsibility for all of us. And so, you know, one of the things that uh, I did earlier this year was brought that traffic sergeant back. So um, we do have one uh, motorcycle officer. You may have seen somebody riding around the city on a motorcycle. That's Sergeant Kratt. He's a one-man band at this point. I'm going to add some motorcycles to him. But just know that we're getting that going. Um, as soon as I, like I said earlier, as soon as I can put two more officers on a, on a motor, we're going to do that because we know how important traffic is. Just remember, though, I always caution uh, these groups. If you ask for traffic enforcement and then you get pulled over and get a ticket, you can't come back and get mad at the police department. We know, studies will sh have shown, that the greatest way to reduce speeding and traffic violation is for citations. That's how we correct behavior. And so um, we're going to be vigilant out there on the street. Um, yes. All right. With that, I almost got through it. <laughs> Extra credit to someone who asked me something on my page that I didn't cover in this 10 minutes. I'll let the mic go there. Hello, I'm so glad you came here. Uh, Jean Bosman, I've lived here only, I can't say 30 years, let's say more than 20 in this community, and it is mostly safe. But the traffic thing really, really, really is a problem, and I walk my dog every night, same place, right by Ramos Park, right by Mitchell Park, and the real problem we have is there's nobody out there at all, not just police, there's just not enough eyes, right? And my real concern is not selfish, I see the little kids. What happens, it's twilight, and it's on East Meadow and Lewis and over here, and these little kids don't understand traffic, okay? And they'll get ahead of their grandparents, they'll get ahead of their parents, it drives me crazy. Because what we don't wanna see is one of these guys who's zipping through, or women, uh, at 40 miles an hour, flipping a kid up in the air, and it could happen so easily. What I'd like to see is more proactive for many reasons, not just you guys, and also I'd like to see more signs, more awareness. I'm glad you used that word awareness, because people come off the highway and they think they're still on the highway, and they're not. And one more irony is those roundabouts do work, but when people come off the roundabout, they go faster because there's a straightaway every night, five, six, seven o'clock. I just I, I can't wait till you put on the extra officers. So, thank you.
Thank you so much. You know, let me, let me just say, I'm gonna, you guys are gonna be mad at me, I'm gonna give you a homework assignment. I would like everyone in this room, when you get in your car, if, you, if you're driving away from here, to take a deep breath when you, after you start it up and think, I'm gonna drive safely and responsibly, that's number one. If you have kids, you know, we go every year, we, we work very closely with our school, school district on the safe routes to, to um, schools. That's only one piece of the puzzle. Learning really starts at home, in my opinion. I have three kids myself. It's my responsibility to sit them down and talk to them about being responsible bike riders, uh, wearing their helmet. You know, a, a, a pedestrian and a vehicle, the pedestrian's never gonna win that. And it doesn't matter even if the, kid, if the car is, has the right of way. Um, and so, you know, I would encourage you to go home and have a conversation with your children about bike safety. The other thing is, is that we, we, we have officers out that we're deploying on overtime uh, for traffic, specifically for traffic enforcement. So again, I encourage you to go to, the, go to our website, Palo Alto Police, just Google it. You can put in a complaint on traffic speeding on middle field speeding on alma here's one you probably never heard speeding on embarcadero right that never happens <laughs> we will get out there and i will assign an officer out there um, and together let's make a dent in this thing thank you for your question i'm frank rothacker 3017 greer road and uh, i'm wondering what to do about a, a new and very expensive bicycle that was abandoned on my property yeah thanks frank yeah, a couple things. You can uh, call our non-emergency line. An officer can come out and get that for you. You can bring it down to our lobby, and uh, we can take that for safekeeping. You can try and reunite it with its owner. I'm sure there's someone that's probably missing it. The person right here who's okay. been waiting. Hi. Um, is Palo Alto responsible for the timing of the lights on Middlefield Road? That's probably my partner, Philip Cammy, in traffic. So we can certainly pass that along if you would like to get a hold of me after the meeting. Okay. Um, and the other thing is, who's responsible for keeping the bushes low enough that you can see the traffic that's coming? So that's our public works, and see me for that one, too. I'll take them both for you. Hi. Um, I will now. Can you Here. just, there you go, I just want to be able to make eye uh, contact I with you. I live on a HOA and we have a central uh, mailbox. It's been the fourth time that the entire mailbox boxes were broken into. A credit card was stolen and checks and there is a real uh, fraud and identity theft that is going on for multiple residents at, at our area. And you then didn't mention that as one of the top crimes. Since this is the fourth time that this is happening, I think maybe in the year and a half, we have a reason to believe that this is uh, the same person or at least group of people. It, is anything can be done about that? Yeah, absolutely. And you know, sadly, this is not a new scenario. And we've worked with different HOAs. In fact, uh, we partnered with OES and Chief Duker, and we can get some strategies in place. And I can assign some supervisors to work with you directly. So, so come find me after the meeting. We'll set something up. Hello, thank you for the opportunity. Um, speaking of traffic, it seems to be on everybody's mind and it's a very worthwhile subject. So with that, I bought a really nice bike. Now I'm afraid to take the bike in fear that even with locking it up, it's gonna get vandalized or stolen. How can I find a happy medium here so that I leave the car at home, use the bike and not be uh, sweating bullets wherever I go, wondering if my bike is gonna be there when I get back. Yeah, and let me, let me just acknowledge your frustration. You're trying to lower the carbon emissions and you're riding your bike, which is what we want to do. And I'm, I'm sorry that you have to have that worry. You know, we're, we're out there. Um, we do work bike theft. I won't tell you how, but we do, do run operations. We catch a lot of people stealing bikes, believe it or not. Um, um, and so, you know, I, security is going to be part of it. Um, so I wish I had a better answer for you, but I feel for you. Uh, hi, uh, I'm a 12 year resident of uh, Midtown um, and I have now a middle schooler, but my, when my kids were much younger and still now we have an issue getting access to uh, Hoover Park because we live on the other side of Middlefield and there's no crosswalk there and it's not easy to walk, you know, either toward all the way to Phil's or all the way past Safeway to just cross to go to Hoover where there's a very nice path. 
I've written to the city about this, but I've been told that it's one of these undoable, impossible things to actually have a safe way to cross Middlefield. Um, so I'm just wondering, you know, what we can do about that. Thank you. So it's really a question for Philip Cami and traffic. Um, why don't we meet after the meeting and why don't you talk with me a little bit more about your scenario and we can talk about some, some next steps. Okay, um, yeah, just real quickly since people are talking about um, the roundabout. Raise your hand for me just so I can see. Yeah, the roundabout at uh, East, East Meadow and Ross. Um, if I remember right, the signs on that used to be yield all four ways and it got changed to where there are now stop signs on Meadow and Ross is free to go through it. And I've noticed that it's become more dangerous because people that go through on Ross have the expectation that they can clip on through at 15 or 20. So I would just encourage going back to yield signs all four ways so that everybody has to approach with caution. Let the applause occur. Yeah, and, and I will pass that along, and we're aware of that. And so um, from an enforcement side, we do have our office that's, that's on our radar with our officers. So we've been living uh, at the corner of East Meadow and Cowper Street for over 30 years. And um, I'm wondering if there's been any thought to maybe improving um, maybe by speed bumps or um, more visible crosswalks or something to avoid accidents, especially in the morning. There's an awful lot of kids on their bicycles and walking. I actually called 911 two weeks ago when a pedest two pedestrians that were in the crosswalk were hit. And so I also bike down that way when I ride my bike to work and I have to dodge the cars that are pulling over into the side to drop off kids why don't we force them to maybe go through mitchell park drop them off at the along the grass instead of having all of this cross traffic with parents that are in such a rush to, to drop off their kids in the morning yeah again i mean so there's there's really t you know there's two components of this one is the design that's that's the traffic and i don't mean to be skirting these questions and then the other is the enforcement which the police department handles so you know what i can tell you is i'm happy to meet with you afterwards and write down your concerns and connect you with someone that can get you some answers on that Let's take one more question. It certainly sounds like there's so much interest that the city, we, we can ask the city to set up a separate meeting on traffic. How to, can I show of hands, let's see? Okay, well, um, it'll be so. Um, and you'll, you'll see our chief again. So last question. That's a uh, that's Phil Cami in, in traffic. How about a police question? Does anybody have something that I can? I feel like I'm I'm skirting my responsibility up here. Who's got something on? Um, hi, uh, a question to you. Uh, a relative of mine, uh, like uh, a couple of years ago, I believe, uh, had two accidents, uh, essentially hit and run. And it turned out that both cameras that were supposed to uh, uh, record these accidents were off. So uh, my question is, who is maintaining uh, traffic cameras? And uh, are they actually in good repair? And do you uh, know which are working and which aren't? Because that might solve your uh, uh, problem with extra policemen yeah um, so that doesn't operate out of the police department um, I can work with uh, Office of Emergency Services and traffic what was the intersection um, I don't remember exactly one was um, in Spencer Shopping Center and the other was close to Costco Mountain View okay Thank you, Chief Bender, and we will ask the city to set up a separate traffic meeting along with police. 
um, for South Palo Alto. So I know all of these, these are incredibly important issues, so we could have each one of these speakers just be on the podium by themselves, but um, the next speaker is our Planning and Development Director, Jonathan Late, to talk about housing, which again could be a separate topic, but take it away, Jonathan. Right. Thank you, Annette. Uh, so as uh, stated, I'm Jonathan Late. I'm the Director for Planning and Development Services, so that's the, the planning side and also the, the building side, pulling permits. Uh, the City Council has had um, on its priority list for many years now, uh, housing as a priority, and that's taken different, uh, you know, shape and, and terminology, but at the end of the day, um, housing preservation and production are key to uh, the council's initiatives. This also ties with the, uh, the state mandated update to, this, to the city's housing element. Every jurisdiction in, in California goes through this process. Uh, we are, uh, we've been two, three years now into uh, updating our local housing element. We submitted it to the state for an initial review. They gave us a robust comment letter back telling us some areas where they suggested some refinements. Uh, the city council adopted uh, the housing element in May and that was transmitted to the state for the review. Uh, again, they um, offered some 20 odd different uh, comments uh, suggesting things that we can do to achieve their certification. Certification is the goal. Um, and that was the deadline that we had back in January 31st of this year to try to have a, a certified housing element. And there was a comment earlier about the builder's remedy that's tied to that date. The, um, the most recent set of corrections that we've received does require us to make some additional changes to our plan. Uh, as part of this effort, we look at the city and we try to identify areas where there's additional housing opportunities. We need to plan for about 6,000 new net new housing units in the city over an eight year planning horizon. And then in addition to that, we have to have a surplus in case some of those sites that we've identified actually do not get built with housing, they get built with something else. And so this buffer uh, takes us to about 66, 6,700 units that we're trying to plan for. So we know we have to make some changes to our initial list of inventory sites. And so we're, we're working on that. And there's a number of programs that are included in the housing element that also require some refinement. And so staff is, is looking at that as well. We hope to uh, go to the Planning and the Transportation Commission and the City Council in the first quarter, two separate meetings, in the first quarter of next year with the housing element update. Um, a second part that you should be aware of is the housing element implementation. So we have an adopted housing element, and since we are relying on some um, changes to our local zoning to meet that 6,600 number that I mentioned earlier, we have to proactively make changes to our code to eliminate barriers to housing production. These are constraints that we have in our zoning code or other aspects of governmental constraints. We have committed to making a number of changes before the January 31st, 2024 deadline. So that is our, our timeline to have these zoning code changes updated. We uh, went to the city council with a study session a couple of weeks ago, and we presented uh, an idea for some additional changes to the housing element. Uh, this is in coordination with the city council housing ad hoc. Um, and those changes were presented to the planning and transportation commission this last, yeah, this past week, I was just trying to keep track of my dates here. Um, so on the 13th, the Planning and Transportation Commission reviewed that plan and they have forwarded a recommendation onto the City Council uh, for an approval of a, a variety of changes that includes upzoning some properties, um, adding, increasing the density to some uh, multifamily areas, as well as you've probably heard in the industrial portions of town uh, making some changes to upzone and increase uh, development potential in those areas. Um, so those those changes uh, we hope to send to the city council in November, so next within the next month um, for the city council to review and to um, enact, so that we can be in compliance with our adopted housing element. So I think that's all I want to say. You can hold on to your one minute card. I will be available to answer questions. And again, we have two mics that are roving the, the room. So if you wanna raise your hand.
Thank you. I've been in Palo Alto a really long time, and I am, wo you are, I am wondering if you are the department that is also responsible for the, quote, Palo Alto process that is so well known all over the area. So if you're asking about the entitlement process to have um, projects approved in the city, that is the planning part of planning and development services. You, uh, depending on the type of application, you have to get a planning entitlement. So that is that process. I, I think I'm more concerned with the sort of the day-to-day -day staff level, the way people interact with us, the clients, and how long some of it takes, how unresponsive they are in some cases. I have some personal examples, but I know that contractors that we've talked to that are less likely to want to come and work in Palo Alto because of what they call the Palo Alto process. So I think it would be appropriate to look at how that work is managed in your department and see if there are some efficiencies and more, um, shall we say, customer friendly uh, activities that can happen. Yeah, no, thank you. Thank you for that comment. And uh, if I can take a few minutes just to respond to that. So um, the Palo Alto process can refer to a number of things, and um, I won't get into what those variations might be, but part of it is the regulatory process in which you get an approval. Uh, the part that you're speaking to is more of a customer service, the interaction of our staff with um, contractors, home builders, uh, to uh, pull a permit at the counter. And once a permit's been issued, the inspection process that, that follows. And it, it is true, I have heard those stories as well about some uh, interactions that are not um, in line with my vision of how we would like to see our department uh, run. And there's a couple of things that you should know who have experienced that or are, have talked to contractors who are expressing similar comments. One is we've had a building permit audit done by Baker Tilly last year. We're gonna go to the Policy and Services Committee next month, November, to uh, talk about our progress in making some changes to the way that we perform our operation, our business. Uh, later this month, internally, I've set up a customer service training um, uh, opportunity for all of our staff that engages with the public. Part of the pandemic has been a challenge for us. Once we uh, shifted to a remote or online operation, we really lost those touch points with our customers, and that has hurt us badly. And we're doing everything we can to restore those opportunities. We now are uh, in present uh, at the Development Center four days, um, Monday through Thursday, and every Friday by appointment. Um, we take appointments and we will meet with people online or virtually. Our customers, our um, inspection program has uh, changed significantly. The culture of that program has really been modified and um, we're getting a lot of positive feedback in the approach in that area. So now the deal is to try to extend that to the counter operations and that engagement with uh, people who are filing applications. So I understand the concerns. I appreciate you mentioning them and we are working to re reverse that. Thank you. Uh, regarding your comment about the industrial area and the development, I, I understand that this is including West Bayshore area. Fabian and West Bay, so sure. Yes. So we have uh, uh, two major problems there. One is the traffic. Uh, there is a very dangerous curve coming from Oregon Expressway to uh, West, Shore, West Bay Shore, and it's not addressed. I mean, uh, almost accidents or accidents is a daily thing there. Uh, from what I read, and I don't know, um, I'm asking for information for you, traffic was not part of the consideration. Can you... Uh, um, address that? Yeah, so there is, so we are looking, so there's a couple of layers. When we say that we want to put or plan for housing in a certain part of the city, there's a couple of things that we're looking at. Do we have adequate services? Uh, we've had conversations with police, with fire, our utilities operations, and our tra transportation offices as well. So the systems are available or exist to support those operations, but that doesn't mean that there's some improvements that aren't needed to help achieve those goals. And part of understanding the details of that is preparing a plan. There's two things that the city council has done. One is that it's authorized us to work with Cal Poly um, to, in their planning program to prepare a concept plan to help jumpstart our planning initiative uh, in this area. And that's, I'm not a part of that school, but I've seen a lot of people who have graduated from that program. Uh, I'm hopeful that we're gonna have a nice uh, 
some quality work from them. Um, but it's just the beginning. And what it's going to look at is traffic issues or the traffic issues that we have there, uh, the services that are available in this area because we want to create a, a neighborhood that has amenities and services like other parts of Palo Alto. Uh, so we need to identify how do kids get to schools, um, what are the safe ways to get across some of these uh, difficult um, uh, boulevards that we have. So that's going to be part of a, an initial study. The City Council has also authorized through their budget process a more expanded uh, analysis of the San Antonio area. And so that will be part of the next phase that we will look at um, to integrate traffic, housing, services, and all the things that we would anticipate for housing in this neighborhood. On the same area, one more question. Uh, it's the only stretch next to the 101 that doesn't have a wall to protect the neighborhood from pollution, noise pollution, air pollution, and other pollution. You look to the south, you look to the west, you look to the north, all cities around us as a continuous wall. We are the only one exposed and it's very affecting our day-to-day -day life. We breathe it, we hear it, we see it. What has to happen in order to have a wall in this part between Palo Alto and the 101? Yeah, thank you. I actually don't know the answer to that question as I'm standing before you, but I think if I work with our colleagues, I could um, try to explore that further. And if you want to meet afterwards, I can get your name and contact information so I can get back to you with that. Okay, thank you. Uh, Valerie Stinger, I have a question. I had a question, and um, I think maybe you've answered it previously. Um, thinking about housing, particularly along San Antonio, I support increased housing, but it's kind of like taking medicine. I think we have to. But when you say a neighborhood, then I get really excited because there's an opportunity to bring in, to make that neighborhood something different that Palo Alto doesn't have. And I wonder if that's part of the planning process you're talking about. And then I also wonder if, um, you know, that will co be costly if we can add. Does SB4 allow us to charge the contractor a, a fee to support the increased development of services? So, uh, so the short answer is yes. We are um, recognizing through a planning effort that we want to study all aspects of what does ho um, new housing bring to this area. Um, again, I mentioned services, and I didn't talk too much about the multimodal access that we want to encourage in this area. I will note San Antonio is, is one of our few truck routes in the city, so we also have to plan for and accommodate that type of traffic as well. Um, there will be some costs, uh, obviously. The planning initiative itself is going to be some costs, which will identify um, uh, some opportunities for improvement. I think once we go through that process and we identify what those needs are, we can look at opportunities for funding and how that could be achieved. We do have certain development impact fees that we charge uh, developers for certain services and, and facilities, um, and including the transportation mitigation fee that is applied citywide. So we just need to understand what the specific uh, improvements are needed, and then we can develop a strategy for how to, to address those challenges. Do I just go there oh. first? Hi, my, here, here. Yes. Faith Brigel, I, I met you once or twice. Um, when these ADUs are built, um, they're usually built behind houses in the backyard, and there are already established fences. And this might not seem like a major issue, but when someone's living right beside, if, they're, if the fence is damaged, I know the usual um, idea is that both people share the cost of rebuilding a fence, but if it was pretty much okay before, and then with the ADU, with construction workers and, and materials going back and forth, if it ended up getting much more damaged than it was before, it seems to me there should be some rule that when they're building the, when they're already paying for the cost of the construction, that the fen that a fence, if needed, should be included, rather than the neighbor needing to go to them and say, by the way, would you please pay for the fence? I mean, it just, you know, doesn't always go that well. Yeah, no, understood. 
And ADUs, of course, are a big issue. Um, there's been uh, not only local changes, but changes to state law that makes this really um, uh, easy for people to want to, uh, to be able to build ADUs. Uh, with respect to uh, fences, the, you know, it, it really gets down to the specifics of the site. I would first say, reach out to your neighbor, and try to have a conversation if you're able to do that. Um, if, not, if you're not able to do that or if it doesn't go well, the first questions that come to my mind is whose fence is it? Is it on your property line or the neighbor's property line? If it's their fence, uh, then they would have that ability to have a fence or not have a fence or repair the fence. Unless it's a safety issue, we would not require them to make some upgrades or changes to it. Um, there's nothing that says you have to have a property line fence. And uh, in, in what you would do in this situation is you'd get a surveyor, a land surveyor, to come out and find out where the property line fence is. And um, while it's a common um, courtesy uh, to split the cost of building a fence, um, uh, that's not written anywhere. If you're going to put it on the property line, you might come together and you might share the expense with that. But if it's their fence and they're not caring about it, uh, you can offer to help fix it or you can build your own fence on your property line. We can talk more about the details later because we have other okay. items on the agenda. Can take one more, more question and let's uh, then move on yeah. to the next. Okay, uh, sorry for that. Uh, Mr. Late, I want to clarify one policy I heard from the city staff, which are quite related with every citizen in the Midtown. Uh, under the Act of a Low Income Density Program, a developer can ask for unlimited concessions. Uh, for example, the developer can uh, get the even above the maximum the height uh, of the any pro project. Uh, which is brought by, for example, example in the Soto Avenue, uh, a pro uh, project was uh, proposed to build a 36 feet apartment just nearby those R1 zones. This brings a lot of concerns from the neighborhood. As we all know, the Midtown was closed. Uh, a lot of um, uh, apartment area with R1 zones. We simply don't want to have any, for example, five floor apartment near the R1 zones, but it seems like the city are okay with uh, give concessions on all kinds of uh, those uh, uh, privacy, density, and the safety issues. Just uh, open the road for low density program. We want to clarify the positions and the policy from the city side. Thank you. Great. Thank you for that question. Um, for those who aren't familiar with the project, there's an existing eight-unit apartment building that's going to be redeveloped with a 12-unit townhome development. And um, the, on Sutter, um, 700 block of Sutter. And um, the, uh, the short answer, I guess, is that the state legislature uh, has, and signed by the governor, has, makes, has made significant changes to state law in terms of housing. And they have given more strength to the ability for a developer, a home builder, to build housing even if it does not comply with local development standards. The state density bonus law that was referenced in the question um, provides that if a developer um, places a certain percentage of low income housing units in the development, they are entitled to certain waivers and concessions from uh, local zoning. And in fact, it's an unlimited amount of, um, of waivers that can be sought. So the standard zoning that you um, anticipate or expect in uh, the local zoning code and you would expect your neighbors to, be, to, to build, while it doesn't affect the R1 zone generally, when the R1 zone is adjacent to a multifamily zone where you would see this type of development, we will um, see this tension uh, in what is provided for and allowed by state law and our local process and what we would otherwise like to see. I'm happy to talk to you about the specifics of the project, but this is an area where local control uh, is really not very strong. Challenging topic. So moving on to our final issue, and then we'll go to open mic in about 10 minutes. We have Director of Community Services, Christian O'Kane, with some exciting new developments on Coverly. 
Thank you, Annette, and good afternoon, everyone. I'm Kristen O'Kane, the Community Services Director. So um, as Annette said, I'm gonna provide an update on Cubberly, and I'm happy to say that I do have an update on Cubberly. Um, we did include a printout on a poster board in the front of the room that shows Cubberly. And what I wanted to emphasize with that is, um, if you want, first of all, if after we're talking and we're doing the social Q&A part, I'll station myself over there for additional questions. And um, it's also good to see that map to really see how Cubberly functions. Um, it shows what the city's ownership of the land is and the school districts and who's um, responsible for each of those buildings. Um, all of those buildings are, almost all, are occupied by some sort of program or activity. Um, Cubberly is a very active, vibrant community center. Um, a lot has happened after, or to bring it back to how it was before the pandemic, so it's very active. Um, what hasn't happened really is what we're gonna is a decision on what we're gonna do next with Cubberly. And the reason I say that is um, it's really hit the end of its useful life. So our public works department just recently did a um, facility assessment report. And while it's in draft, um, some of the conclusions show that Cubberly is in poor condition. Um, it will require over $45 million in maintenance over the next 10 years. The report also concludes that all but three of the buildings at Cubberly have reached the end of their useful or serviceable life. Um, so that's pretty significant. Um, what we're doing now is we're going to be going to council tomorrow night, actually, um, and asking council to give us direction on how we move forward and the the invitation that was presented to us by the Palo Alto Unified School District was to present proposals or provide proposals to the school district on how the city might be able to acquire more land at Cubberly. So as a reminder, the city only owes, owns eight acres of all of Cubberly. The school district owns 27, and they're inviting us to submit a proposal on how we might acquire more. So we had a study session a couple of months ago with the city council, and now we're going back tomorrow night um, with a staff recommendation, but to ask the city council to direct us on what to do next um, as far as submitting a proposal. So I encourage you to um, listen to the council meeting. You can come in person, you can watch it on Zoom, and you can also provide your comments to the council during the public comment period. Um, we'll be providing a lot more information on the different options that we've explored um, to do this, um, but I think it's, it's a great next step. Um, hopefully we can reignite the conversation and um, start working on a plan for moving forward with the Cubberly Community Center. Um, I did want to give a brief, for those of you who um, are familiar with Cubberly and use it, there are um, some spaces that are not being occupied right now, um, mostly the gyms, gym A and gym B, because there was significant water damage um, that occurred. Jeez, it's, I feel like it's almost two years ago, maybe a year and a half, um, and significant water damage happened to those gyms and they're, we just cannot use them. Um, so that's been a big impact to our community who, you know, we rent those gyms from morning till 10 o'clock at night um, with different activities. So we are at the point now where our public works department is hiring someone to come in and do the remediation of those, um, the damaged areas of the gym, and we're hoping to get um, them up and running I would say the beginning of next year, so 2024. So there's three significant steps that need to happen to get those gyms back um, up, and, up and running and so people can start using them again. So that is my update. Um, I got my, my one minute and almost my stop card. So I am here to answer questions. And like I said, I'll be posted over there by the map if anyone wants a more, um, detailed information on the Cubberly site or we'll answer questions there as well.
So thank you. All right, I'm off the hook, thank you. Well, Kristen did such a fine job of explaining it. I'm sure everyone's gonna watch Council tomorrow night. Well, let's give our speakers a big round of applause. <laughs> we're, we're lucky to have, have them in their positions, and again, we appreciate their service. So now we're gonna do open mic for about a half an hour. Anything you want to ask these people, we also have our two other public safety chiefs available for you. It's your turn. Uh, if you didn't get your question answered on any of these hot topics, this is the time to do so. So, Sylvia, you've got your hand raised. I'm right speaker. here. Um, I have a question. I live near uh, station number four that's gonna be demolished and a new fire station will be built. I'm wondering how is traffic and the construction workers parking going to be dealt with given that fair meadow is you know adjacent to uh the fire station where is our trip here we go city manager thank you i was going to offer the mic to our fire chief to perhaps uh speak to the plans for fire station four um, and also what's going to happen with the temporary fire station while it's under construction Thank you, Ed. Good afternoon. My name is Gio Blackshire, Fire Chief here in Palo Alto. And thank you for the question. Who asked the question? There you are back there. Um, so I don't know specifically about the plans in regards to traffic and how the construction will affect the, tra the traffic during construction. However, um, the temporary fire station will be on the, on the Coverly site. And so that's where, and it's very close proximity, so in regards to response and operations, it's very similar to what we're doing now, so we don't see much of an impact at all in that regard. But I believe uh, our uh, Public Works Director, Brad Eggleston, would um, be available to answer that question, so if you want, I can get your information. I'll connect with him uh, tomorrow and make sure that we connect with you to get that question answered. In fact, I should have mentioned this earlier, but we are actually taking note of questions that come up that we don't have the answers to immediately. And so we're gonna follow up with Annette and Sherry to uh, get questions or answers to those questions uh, and hopefully be able to then distribute it after the meeting. That works. Oh, by the way, one other thing I forgot to mention since I was so rushed to get off the mic is that part of the, our economic development work is that we have heard interest in more and maybe different retail in Midtown. As such, we've got these QR codes that have, uh, will take you to a survey that if you are interested in seeing more or different retail in Midtown, that'll allow us to get that uh, direct and very specific feedback. Thanks. Thank you, and we'll put out uh, all of these uh, pieces of information on our Google group so you can look back at them. Sylvia, did you have someone? Let's see. Yeah, I'm Barbara Kreiner, and I have uh, lived here about 60 years. Uh, but my uh, question relates to parking for these the new housing that you're building. And uh, I passed the area that the lady was speaking about on Fabian and uh, Loma Verde, and the houses were built with, uh, I, I guess they thought, uh, sufficient parking but they were young families, and of course, young families have all kinds of stuff which gets parked in the garage, and the cars get parked all down the street. Secondly, it was approved where they really don't have adequate space for parking anyway because it's there on West Bayshore Road, and there's no parking, the same narrow road the lady was talking about a while ago. and three sides of the complex, no parking at all. So where do they park? Down the block in front of other people's home. S now you're building this new complex and I wanted to know about the consideration for parking there. Okay, thank you for that question. Um, so parking, Parking is reviewed during the entitlement process. When a, pro when a, a developer is submitting an application, we review the parking compliance to our local zoning standards. And we stipulate how many bedroom or how many parking spaces are required based on whether it's a studio, one bedroom, or two or more bedrooms. And uh, 
that uh, that standard, uh, it's either they either comply with that requirement, or they take advantage of a state exemption, which is available through again the state density bonus law, um, if there's um, uh, if they're seeking to use that 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 state law, they could reduce parking. Um, locally, if they're not doing that, they would have to ask for some kind of an exception or waiver. And I don't know for the particular projects that you've mentioned whether or not. Um, that was reviewed or granted. Um, there's one other state law that you should be aware of. Um, that's AB 2097. And that provides that any development uh, within a half mile of a Caltrain station, um, so University of California Avenue and over on in Mountain View, no parking is required for any, uh, any development. And again, so this is just another example of um, state regulations that are overriding our local standards. That wouldn't have applied in the, the area that you're talking about now, um, but I'd have to know the property address and research that a little bit further to understand. Uh, understanding what a project doesn't provide sufficient parking. Okay, so we can maybe connect afterwards and I can get that address. Okay. This is a public safety question from a 60-year resident of um, the Midtown area. Since the traffic calming, in quotes, changes to the structure of Ross Road went through, and you've heard part of this complaint before, and the stop signs were eliminated. Since I am blind now, it is completely unsafe for me to cross any street. I can't hear the electric cars, but when I knew that there were four-way stops or even two-way stops, I could predict with some accuracy about when I would not be hit if I tried to cross the street. I just really want to re-endorse the plea to get the stop signs back. The traffic calming on Ross Road has been an out and out disaster. Nothing has gone more slowly. The kids on bikes now are having to whiz way into the middle of the street to get anywhere. And for those of us who are limited pedestrians, and I think there are probably more of us with low vision and further decrements of vision into blindness, that Palo Alto, it would be nice if some consideration went into that aspect of safety. Thank you. Thank, thank you for bringing that up. And I, I just wanna let you know that we hear you and I will follow up with Philip Cami, and we will get back to you. Thank you. Are you? Oh. <laughs> so Kristen, you had a mic. Kristen, okay. uh, All right. this side of the room. Okay, thank you. Um, my name is Kristen Van Fleet, and I'm speaking on behalf of the Ellsworth Place residents who are advocating for the safety of our intersection with Middlefield Road. We have a unique set of circumstances here, and the sidewalk is heavily used by pedestrians and cyclists alike who are traveling between the shopping centers and the recreational centers and the schools, as have been mentioned earlier in this meeting. This also coincides with the uh, need for a crosswalk at Middlefield Road to get to Hoover Park, and we are part of this whole intersection situation. Uh, now developers are threatening litigation against the city if they don't get their way, and their current plans would make our situation more dangerous than it is now. We have brought this to the attention of the city 10 years ago. We were told nothing could be done at that time, and now the city is forcing this project through because of threat of litigation, and we find this to be um, a deplorable use of city funds and our time. But nonetheless, we want to keep the situation safe, and we do not want somebody injured or worse killed at this intersection. So my question for you, uh, everybody, is how are you going to make this situation at Ellsworth Place and Middlefield Road safer? Thank you. Okay, so um, thank you for, for your comment, and I know that you've been active and engaged in, uh, there's a uh, pending application uh, on file that I'm sure you're aware of. And uh, this has been reviewed. It went to the city council, and the city council continued the project back to uh, um, study a few different aspects. 
of the project, uh, including some of the loading zone uh, concerns on um, Ellsworth Place and uh, some visibility uh, concerns and with uh, an interest to look at widening the easement on uh, that's available from the private property to access Ellsworth Place. So um, I can say that we've got a number of council members in this room right now and um, we are in the process of sending that back to their review. The tentative date is November 6. I believe that's a Monday. Um, and uh, that's when that item will come back. Separately, if there's other uh, elements beyond the project, as you've referenced about intersection safe safety, I'm gonna borrow from my colleague and um, suggest that we might wanna get Philip Cammy uh, engaged on some of the um, crosswalk uh, concerns that you might have an interest in um, that the community may want, have, um, want us to look at in that area. We would need to bring Philip into that conversation and, and have that, that dialogue. It's just a, a comment. I was asked by someone um, how to get on the Google group, and it's very easy if you just want updates, either give me your email or if you pick up a brochure from the Midtown residents, we're happy. We really consider anyone whose heart in Midtown is a Midtowner, but, and the Google group um, addresses on that. So, Sylvia, did you have someone? This lady has a question. Hi, this is a general public health question directed to council members. What are you guys going to do to reduce airplane noise? Well, if I could answer that question positively, I'll get reelected 10 times. <laughs> so let me do my best. So I've, uh, I've been serving on the SFO roundtable, uh, as well as the now defunct Santa Clara, Santa Cruz County. Uh, Roundtable, this has a, been a big issue for, for me as well as council and of course community members across the city. One of the big frustrations that I'm sure you're aware is at the end of the day the FAA has the final decision when it comes to all of these, all of these different routes. And a frustration for Palo Alto is we have been shut out of the SFO Roundtable. We had a good, we had a very uh, I think we had a shot about a year ago to be able to get onto that round table. Uh, things were looking positive, and then former Co Congresswoman Jackie Speer sent a letter to the SFO round table saying, do not include Palo Alto, don't extend the, the membership really beyond San Mateo County. So that was, a, that was a big frustration and a setback. But just because that door has been closed doesn't mean we have stopped the effort. We have now been going an alternative route uh, to really work directly with San Francisco Airport. We've had conversations with the, di with the director at SFO uh, regarding how can we now kind of put forth Palo Alto's version of alternative routes that could then be really kind of carried by SFO to the FAA and for them to advocate on our behalf with our partnership to be able to get some of these alternative routes. Many community members have been very instrumental in designing these alternative routes that should have significant impact on, on our quality of life. Um, but it is, a, as you can imagine, a long process. We think the Palo Alto process is slow. The federal process is far worse. Shocking, look how great Congress is doing right now. Um, but so I'm, I'm optimistic that we now have this new engagement with the San Francisco airport. It's just taking time and I know it's, frust it's frustrating. Every morning, 3 a.m., I hear this you know, large 747 that we probably all are very aware of in Midtown flying in. So it's a frustration and we're, we're doing all, all we can, um, just understanding the, the limitations there. But um, we're gonna have another, another community meeting soon. I'm trying to schedule that with the, San, with the San Francisco Airport Director to be able to kind of follow up on some of those issues, and I'm happy to chat with you more afterwards. Yeah. Hi. Um, I don't know which department to ask this general question to, but um, I was wondering whose responsibility is to have uh, crossing guards for the students on their way to and from school in the morning. Um, I, my, I have a high schooler who now goes to school about an hour early because the crossing guards leave before the high school students uh, start school. So I was wondering if there's some way to extend the time that they're on the crossing. It's for El Camino and Alma and all the big 
uh, crosses there. So the, uh, the police department managed the crossing guard contract um, and crossing guards have been in the news uh, recently. So um, why don't you come with, to meet with me afterwards and we can talk about uh, some options potential for you. Hi, I'm just concerned about um, parking, particularly construction parking, particularly on days when there's um, street cleaning. We have no way of keeping our streets clean if people are going to park when the street cleaners come. And it's also the same on Utilities Day. When I moved into our house, we used to have the stacking uh, crates. Then they changed to the big three big wheelie bins. And um, we have no curb space. People either side of us have either extended their driveways or put in another driveway. And so my utilities is not collected when they have people parked blocking my bins. I put my bins out and someone comes and um, parks there. So I get a note, a rude note put out by utilities saying cars blocking, can't get to them. And this is something that um, that I have as a particular, w where my house is, I'm on a sort of like an inside curve, but we don't have a, a, a good way of knowing, of people knowing when street sweeping is going on. Can we have some street sweeping signs so that um, people won't park on street sweeping days? Yeah, I would like to get your particular information uh, after the meeting and we'll follow up with our public works department that also handles the refuse collection. Uh, it is a balance because, you know, to a certain extent, people don't want the regulation of parking being prohibited unnecessarily, but it certainly sounds like your situation is one that, uh, you know, it's, again, it's a balancing act and it's important to be able to get those services. And again, that applies elsewhere as well. Hello, Jonathan. <laughs> this is for you. I have a couple of uh, easy to ask questions, not so easy to answer. Um, the first one that I've, I've heard concern from people about our neighborhood centers like Midtown, Charleston Plaza, um, being redeveloped to mixed use with housing over retail. Uh, that would destroy the viability of the neighborhood centers. Is there anything we can do um, to prevent that from happening, I understand in Midtown with 12 different owners, it's not as much of a problem, but I worry about, uh, about the others. That's my first question. Um, and while you're answering it, I'll try to remember my second question. Uh, so, um, so thank you for the question. It comes down to zoning and what do we allow to be uh, developed on a particular property? And in this area, uh, we would allow for commercial uses. Um, I think there might even be a requirement for ground floor uh, retail uh, and then but if somebody did want to come forward and, and redevelop and put housing on top that would be consistent with our zoning so if this if the community doesn't want to see that and I think it's also on our housing inventory sites as well that one's not okay great thank you um, so uh, if we want to change the zoning then that's the process that we would need to go through to discourage that type of development Okay, and um, my second question keeps going out of my mind. Just give me a, a second. <laughs> oh, uh, this uh, about affordable housing and, and truly affordable housing, not 120% of AMI. How do we incentivize or what can we do to make sure that we're developing 100% um, or close to 100% affordable housing because this 20% BMR units it's just not going to do it. We're not going to. We're not going to meet our requirements that way. So, what what can we do to incentivize affordable housing uh, companies like Eden, you know, and all to uh, be able to afford to build that kind of housing in Palo Alto? Okay. So there's a couple of different threads to pull on there. One is um, so if you don't know, when somebody's building multifamily housing in the city. Uh, and there's apartments, they, uh, a developer can pay into an in-lieu fee. That fee goes to fund our um, affordable housing program to support Eden and Wilt, uh, Alta Housing and other uh, nonprofit home builders. When somebody is building ownership housing, we have a local requirement for 15% inclusionary, which is deed restricted 
to or income restricted at uh, certain thresholds uh, higher than what Sherry was, was referencing at 100% of the area median income of Santa Clara County up to 120%. Um, to get the type of uh, developments like Wilton Court or the, the one on Charleston um, more recently entitled, um, it's a function of uh, a couple of things. One is, um, uh, you know, our development standards have a lot to say about whether a nonprofit home builder wants to build um, or could build in the city and what that process, going back to the Palo Alto process, looks like. Um, Wilton Court had to go through uh, a hearing before the city council uh, and then to the planning commission and then to the architecture review board and then back to the planning commission and then back to the city council before it was able to get approved. That is the Palo Alto process for that piece, but the council made changes and made uh, that process much more streamlined and so now it's architectural review. The council also made changes to the development standards to allow for greater height and density and development. So we are in partnership with these uh, nonprofit home builders uh, and we meet with them. We uh, try to identify sites that they're interested or we wanna hear from them about what sites are available to them. When we have sites, we can have a conversation about um, uh, affordable housing uh, in those areas, uh, but often we are uh, hearing from them on uh, opportunities where they would want to build. Funding is a big piece of it. Um, when we give money, we're, uh, if a unit is about $800,000 per unit to build, the city in the past has been able to contribute about 300, 350 toward each of those units. The rest of it comes from tax credits and those are very competitive and they're not the only uh, ones applying for those, um, those funds. So sufficient there or and we can dive more deeply afterwards. Okay, hi, I'm Debbie Mitel. I've lived on Lewis Road for about 40 years or more. Um, and I've recently been really happy that I've gotten one of the city's electric heat pump water heaters. And I have a comment or a question for the city, but I first wanted to ask, how many of you in the audience here know about the city's electric heat pump water heater program? Let's see your hands. Okay, that's good. There's a flyer on the back for those that don't know about it. It's a great opportunity. So just curious as to not that many people have so far participated in the program, but we're hoping that it will be extended and how much longer will this be available to people? on my lap and so I'm too embarrassed to stand. So <laughs> let me respond on the list. It will at least be going through the end of the year for sure and it does look like we'll have capacity to continue it into next calendar year. Uh, also note that uh, to the point, our uh, uptake, so to speak, on the thousand water heaters that we set the goal uh, to achieve has not come close to being achieved. And so we're looking at other options that we can use to scale up the availability and interest from community members. But there are great rebates that are available. It is a great time to look at getting an electric heat pump water heater, as well as maybe do some other upgrades to be prepared for the future. I'm just gonna take a minute to jump in here and say thank you, Debbie, for yesterday's electric home tour. So any of you went on that, you can thank this woman here. It was marvelous, my husband and I went. I could not believe the number of people circulating and so thank you for doing that. I have to mention that Debbie was the very first person that brought the Midtown residents together, our first chair, so you have another dignitary in the audience. More questions? Over here, this gentleman right here. Uh, I wanted to ask the uh, city council. I wanted to ask the city council if uh, they are aware of the crisis that is uh, approaching Palo Alto uh, in the years ahead in terms of the high-speed trains that will be coming through, electrified Caltrain, uh, the high-speed rail system. We're going to have trains coming very frequently at up speeds up to 110 miles an hour. And I've seen, uh, we, we've been living with the Caltrain tracks ever since they were created at ground level. That is clearly not going to work in the future. And I know you have developed some plans for options on new kinds of grade crossings 
that will supposedly eliminate the, the danger of crossing and the, 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 the difficulty in, uh, in, 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 in traffic. But I am not inspired by the, those plans. Uh, they're expensive and uh, they require things that I don't think are necessary. By far a better solution would be a viaduct, get the train up off the ground, enhance the value of the properties of the people that live along the tracks even, and, and make it uh, a much better way to deal with the problem of these high-speed trains and open up Palo Alto from east to west in a way that's never been done. So I, my question is, are you aware of this other option and are you going to consider it, the viaduct option? All right, well, thank you for the question. And uh, I, I sit on the rail committee and the chair is just down the row from you, our council member, Pat Burt, uh, who has also uh, been dealing with this issue for years and years. But yes is the short answer in the sense that we are aware of the different options. I think, as you know, there uh, there's a different, uh, that for Churchill, there's some settled options. And for the South, the viaduct was removed by council. However, there are some studies going on right now that we have asked them to give, to consider the viaduct in those studies and to come back to rail so that we can decide whether to recommend to council to reconsider uh, or the viaduct option. And so all of this is being looked at at the same time as we often hear the pressure to move quickly. And so it's a balancing act between these are decisions that are gonna have decades and decades and decades of impact, but yet we know people are tired of waiting for grade separation because of the safety factor. So we're, tr I don't wanna say we'll move with all deliberate speed, but we're, we want to move as quickly as we can. But yes, there is a, a, a there will be a chance to take a second look at whether to bring that back to council. I don't know if, uh, Chair Burt, would you like to add anything? Did I get it close to right? Okay, <laughs> thumbs up, thank you. No, no, someone over there just spoke, so over here, Pam's next. Hello, I um, have a question and I would like to um, inspire people in this room have you ever thought of saving, uh, reducing electricity use in a passive way with a clothesline? My household has used a clothesline for close to 50 years. Most days of the year, I can tell you with experience, you can use your clothesline. It's passive, it costs money, but some people associate clotheslines with poverty and immigrants at the turn of the last century. Clothesline should be a symbol of pride and kindness because we're not using electricity. And I would love to hear from our utility company, our utility services, how much electricity uh, my household has saved over 50 years by using a clothesline with clothespins. And I put on my clothespins and all the children and grandchildren should know that you can put your grandparents' names, your siblings' names, your best friends' names on those clothespins. And when you're putting those, or someone you're praying for on the clothespin, and when you're hanging your clothes and you put flowers around that, it's very good for your health. So I wanted to encourage people to feel inspired. And I'd love to know from our utility company about how much money a year you you are, or, or, or um, how much you're saving the in utility for our utilities by just buying a clothesline. Thank you. It makes your clothes smell really good. Do any one of you guys want to uh, talk to this? I think that is an assignment. It's an assignment. So thank you for bringing that up. Let's see. Sam, I think has the next question, and Sylvia, maybe you could give Karen a mic, Sam. Yeah, hi everyone, my name is Sam Gersten. I'm a renter I'm on the Midtown Residents Association Steering Committee uh, and I uh, live on Middlefield Road with my young family. Uh, super passionate about you know, making sure we get all those housing units built that, that Jonathan was talking about above and beyond the housing element. And uh, you know, it's, it sounds like there's a lot of things that have to happen to make, to make that plan that Jonathan's been working on happen. Uh, just wondering what the council is doing in terms of density, how, uh, height, parking uh, uh, requirements uh, to, to be able to meet the housing element and, and even surpass it. 
Well, thanks for the question, Sam, and thanks for being on the MRA steering committee and issues that are important to me as well. I'm a renter too. This is something that council has really taken on. I mean, just not only as a priority for housing with a particular focus on affordable housing that we've heard today, but also just the need to be able to get the housing element certified. So we've been doing, I mean, this has gone through many iterations at this point, a lot of community involvement. And what Director Late really went through uh, as far as the study session that we had a couple of weeks ago, really identifying this special housing site along along El Camino that's really going to be, in, in many ways, kind of a, a pilot program to be able to test out what is needed in order to be able to see that level of affordability um, and the number of units that we that we really want. I mean, I think council during that study session had a lot of a lot of positive to say regarding the location close to transit, uh, as, as well as the affordability piece. It's going to be 20 percent affordable housing units at 80 percent AMI. And through conversations with developers over the last years to trying to figure out what is the right sweet spot in order to be able to get that housing bill but also to be able to get the community benefit that we all want as as well. And so that's why I think local zoning really plays a, a, a part here because we need to be able to have that negotiation and that back and forth in order to be able to get that community benefit. And for many of us, that community benefit has been more affordable housing. And unfortunately, and I think this is a good kind of rallying call for people, if you're kind of frustrated with the loss of local control that has been happening for so long, really need us to talk to your state representatives to be able to really advocate for bringing back local control because much of that is going to frustrate. Um, we, I heard comments earlier today about we need to have more, more neighborhoods and this housing needs to be able to have services, police services, water, electric, access to parks and everything. And much of what we try to do in Palo Alto can be frustrated by a lack of that, a lack of that zoning, and lack of that ability for us to be able to uh, require things like park fees and, um, and and other things. So this is a big goal for the city council and for the city, and I think we're we're confident with some of the new zoning proposals that has been, that have been made that we're going to be able to get this housing element certified. Hopefully next, hopefully early next year. Is this on? Okay, is this on? Questions, Karen, you're next, and okay. this gentleman right here. Uh, this may be a little oblique, but I have been looking at all of the hard work that everybody has been doing on housing, and I'm wondering whether one of the sacred cows up there might be reconsidered. At one point, many, many, many years ago, because I've been in Palo Alto a long time, the Deer Creek and the Oak Coyote Hill areas <clears throat> were taken off of the development landscape and considered part of the quote foothills. Deer Creek already has the street, the traffic lights, and I heard rumors that it even had sewer connections before it was stopped. Coyote Hill really feels a little bit more like the foothills. But I'm wondering whether that Deer Creek area, which is pretty long, could be reconsidered as a place to consider doing housing. It might involve Stanford, probably, but you know, could it be reconsidered? I'll, I'll start, but um, at, uh, I'll say it's it's not part of the plan now. Okay. Um, it could be, um, so that's a policy question that uh, the council could uh, could wrestle with. Um, I will say that when we think about housing now um, and trying to locate it near services and uh, transportation uh, alternatives is is more of the push, and if we put high density housing out there we're adding more vehicle miles traveled uh, commute trips through the city uh, whereas if we could locate them you know elsewhere where there's services where people would walk um, more or use transportation that would be that's been our focus does anybody else want to add to that okay that's the best you're going to get out of us right now okay okay i think so Okay, well, let this lady go, and then this gentleman will be the last question, and then we'll turn it over to Councilwoman Ficke. Well, thank you for your time. Um, I'm here with my husband. We've been 
Palo Alto residents for 20 years, and I'm just wondering, I don't know who to d direct this question to, but for the last three months, every third, it appears to be every third weekend, there has been, um, and we live on East Meadow between, right by Adobe Creek, on Fabian, it's on the other side. And for the last three months, every third week, there has been tremendous ruckus, noise. Um, they played really, really, really loud music in the parking lot. Uh, I'm told, I'm not 100% sure that it's owned by Google, it's an empty building. But they come with cars, they do donuts, they, they play the music to the point where our entire house shakes. And I mean, you can't even, you can't watch TV, you can't do anything until they stop. The police have been called several times and we're just told, oh, there's nothing we can do. Who's handing out those permanent permits? Is the building something, ha I mean, we don't know, th these don't seem to be residents. They come from outside. And they, they're to say, oh, they, who's handing out these permits to these buildings um, that we just have to sit there and tolerate it? Uh, and just so I understand your question, is this coming from like a commercial building? Is that? Yes, yes. It's Kay. on Fabian, um, Fabian Way, and there's the Adobe Creek, and then there's East Meadow on the other side. Okay. So all those homes all right along the line, I'm sure they all hear it. Yeah, and, and so I think there's there, there's two there's two issues. That's why I wanted to clarify whether it was a commercial building. So let's let's connect afterwards, and I'll get a little bit more information from you. I um, just we get I get a daily report. I know just last night there were some more drag racers that came into town. That's not unfortunately it's not unusual, specifically for the uh, Bay Area and Palo Alto is not immune. Um, they come unannounced. They come sometimes in the hundreds. They take over an intersection and um, they create a lot of noise and sometimes some damage. So we're very aware of that. We have very good networking capability with our regional partners in the area. And so believe it or not, a lot of times we're able to get to the intersection or the area before they are, but that isn't always the case. And so if you see them coming, if you're out there, um, give us a call and give us a heads up. If you see a lot of cars heading to whatever, um, whatever intersection they may be going to. Okay, one, one last fast question. Uh, hi, my name's Steve Rosenblum. Um, I'd like to thank uh, all of the city council for the hard work that they do. I've only come to a few of their sessions and I really appreciate all the work they do on issues that I'm not involved in and I appreciate their being here on a weekend. Uh, but I also uh, wanted to uh, uh, dis discuss the rail crossing issue. I, I don't think it gets enough attention in the communities that aren't near the tracks. And uh, two of the members of the rail committee are, are here, uh, uh, council members Vinker and Burke, and uh, council member Lowing is the third. Um, I've, I'm in a group that's been supporting the viaduct for a long time. and. Uh, I think people that don't live near the tracks think they don't have a, uh, a concern, but realistically there's only seven ways of cars crossing the tracks in Palo Alto now, and uh, we all have a need to get to the other side of the tracks at one time or another. So we all need to pay attention to this issue, and I urge people to come to the rail committee meetings, to listen virtually or come in person, to understand the issues. Uh, to make sure that they're not misguided by um, uh, arguments that don't have to do with uh, public safety, noise, uh, traffic, uh, that distract from the issues. Uh, as Steve mentioned, we, we think the viaduct is the best solution which overcomes the lack of connectivity between the east and west sides of the city. And uh, if you look at the Connecting Palo Alto website that the city maintains, you'll see drawings and issue uh, information about the costs of the different alternatives and the viaduct is the most expensive one on the table right now but it's only twice as expensive as the next uh, uh, least expensive alternatives so I urge you all to get involved and to put this on your radar thank you thank you and I'm going to now 
let Vicki respond to that along with her closing comments. So you guys have been a great audience. Don't forget, after Vicki and Sherry finish, we have four council members here to chat with and more refreshments in the back along with staff. Thank you, Vicki. Well, and thank you, Annette, um, and thank you for that comment. I would uh, second the please come to the rail committee or listen in or let us know how you think about it. I mean, that's one of the delights of serving this community is we have such informed and active and smart <laughs> uh, residents that, that help us think through these options. And you've heard a few times today that sometimes the solutions, be it traffic or what have you, come from our residents. So we do appreciate that input. And generally, I wanna uh, thank all of you for coming today. It's really great to be with the residents of Palo Verde and the Midtown neighborhoods. Um, you know, you really are a bright spot in what's been a difficult week. Um, you know, this is exactly what we need to do, is to come together um, as a, this is what makes a strong city, a strong nation, a strong world, is to really talk through the difficult issues and to really listen to each other and to see if we can chew things over and, and find solutions. Um, and neighborhood town halls here in our city are one way that we are ensuring an active and engaged community. Um, my council colleagues and I, we really value these conversations. It's nice, I mean, we get plenty of time at the mic, so it's nice to be able to come and listen to you express your concerns, your thoughts, ask questions, hear what's important to you. That's really, truly valuable, and we will take that back to council. Um, so I encourage you to stay connected uh, in the conversation, um, participate about these issues we've addressed today and others. Um, as you heard, for example, Coverly is coming to council tomorrow, so feel free to come there and give public comment. Um, and uh, I wanna also really thank our staff for being here today. I wanna thank City Manager Ed Shikata and the various department heads, and including our fire chief who was not only here today, but it was at fire station number three yesterday and I got to meet the arch arson dog Ashley and so thank you for two days in a row coming and doing public events on a weekend. But thanks to all of you for being here today and taking your Sunday. Um, and I very much wanna thank the Midtown Residents Association and the Palo Verde residents and Annette and Sherry Furman in particular. So Annette Glankoff, thank you for all the planning work you have done to make today happen. Um, we appreciate your leadership uh, in evolving these meetings to be useful for residents because I know you work with our staff to help set the agenda so that they're useful to you and we, we survey you and get the, the, the uh, questions and issues identified that you want answers to. So on behalf of uh, Vice Mayor Stone and myself who are privileged to uh, host this today, thank you so much for coming and we'll be around and I look forward to connecting you afterwards or at a council meeting in the future. And I guess I turn it over to Sherry. So thank you so much. Can you hear, oh yes, you can hear me. Okay, so I'm Sherry Furman. I'm the chair of the Midtown Residents Association, which was formed, it'll be 30 years next year. And uh, I was a latecomer, and I joined in 95 instead of 94, but I've been involved ever since. So first of all, I wanna thank all of you from Midtown and Palo Verde for taking the time to attend this town hall. It's important to have this two-way communication with our, our city leaders and staff. And I want to give more thanks to, although Vicky, Vicky named most, uh, thanked pretty much everybody up here. So uh, I also want to thank Mayor Lydia Koo and Councilman Pat Bird for attending and listening. And to uh, Megan Horgan Taylor for all the organization and the food and, and setting up and uh, all those things, flyers you got in the mail and, and the uh, signboards and everything. And finally, I really want to thank our wonderful moderator, Annette Glankoff, uh, Pal and Palo Alto resident and uh, emergency service volunteer, Tom Fowler, um, and to Sylvia Gardner, Ann Krebs, uh, Sam Gersten, Paula Rugg, and Cindy Campbell for their help in organizing this and getting everything set up. So finally, I want to, I want to talk a little bit about uh, what neighborhood associations do. 
the city and Palo Alto neighborhoods have partnered on emergency preparedness for geez, at least 20 years now. Um, if you haven't already done so, please stop by the table back uh, there for information and please consider becoming an emergency service volunteer. Uh, this is, you know, um, getting your block prepared, just, you know, being aware of what's going on with emergency services and education and all. And then and I also asked, do you appreciate events like this? Um, neighborhood socials, uh, getting email news, uh, and all. all of this result from your neighborhood volunteers. And so we ask you to consider volunteering to help keep us sustained. Some of us, in my case, I've been doing this for a third of my life. And uh, it's, it's work, but it's work I love, you know. So Nextdoor and social media have their place, but they don't replace personal activism. Uh, you need not make a huge commitment, but think about helping on a specific issue or event. There's so many issues coming up that we could always use a little, a little bit of help. Um, MRA has brochures at the back. You probably saw them when you come in to give you an idea of, of uh, what we do and what we need. Again, thank all of you for coming. You're invited to stay and, and speak to our panelists and uh, uh, our stray council members in the audience. And again, I hope this was informative for you. And uh, if you'd like us to do this in the future, you know, be sure and let us know, like on specific issues such as traffic, Midtown. Um, we're always willing to reach out and uh, help for you. So thank you again. Have a great afternoon. Thanks.